Good evening. I want to say welcome to all of those who are in our midweek uh, Bible study. If you're here and you're visiting with us, we consider you our honored guest. For those who are viewing a live stream, we want to welcome you as well. Just want to give you a few announcements before we get started. Uh, Sister Benjamin's uh, mother uh, passed away uh, on, on yesterday, so continue to pray for the I pray for the Benjamin. Uh, Ernest left this morning, I believe, to to go to be with the family. However, uh, the rest of the family could not go because uh, Caleb has like walking pneumonia, and Casey also has um, is also sick as well with some cold symptoms. So, please keep the Benjamin family uh, uh, in your prayers. Remember to pray for our sister Janie White, who is dealing with a lot of uh, back pain and hip and knee issues. Uh, Jerry Downs is still is, uh, recovering from COVID, so uh, please uh, keep him uh, in your prayer. Also, Mary Espinoza still didn't have the baby yet, so continue to pray for her and her safe uh, delivery. Also, uh, Caroline Zarif is, uh, is under the weather as well. Would you pray for her? And uh, T. Jones has to have another uh, surgery uh, coming up, and she asked the congregation to uh, pray for her to be the third one that she has for this uh, situation. So definitely want to keep her in our prayers, and hopefully this one would uh, would help her uh, cure the or bring relief for the situation she's dealing with. Um, I think the ladies retreated this uh, weekend, so I guess you should have most things in order. But just uh, meet with Veronica or or Kat if you need uh, any last minute uh, uh, details and how they're going to meet up and everything, maybe some information also posted on the ladies' uh, bulletin board. I know I'm forgetting something, but. <laughs> okay, if you have like a, a cell phone or anything electronic that would go off during the service, now would be a good time to uh, to put it on mute or to uh, turn it off so it won't uh, interrupt the services uh, this evening. Okay, this time before we begin, we'll uh, be led in the song as we begin our, our diva portion of tonight. Good evening. Good evening. Our first song tonight will be 403, 403. Oh, I want to see him. As I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow, Many arrows pierce my soul from without within. But my Lord leads me on, through him I must win. Oh, oh I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. Cares are past, home at last, ever to rejoice. When before me billows rise from the mighty deep, 
Then the Lord directs my bark, He does safely keep, And He leads me gently on Through this world below. He's a real friend to me, Oh, I love Him so. upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace, on the streets of glory, let me live my voice, cares all past, home at last, Ever to rejoice. Our invitational hymnal will be 149. 149. Good evening, everyone. So glad to see each and every one of you out tonight. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the elders for the opportunity to uh, to be up here. Uh, I know that we need to sharpen our, our skills to be able to spread the word to those we meet on a day-to-day -day basis. Before we get started, uh, many of those of you who know me know that I, as a boy, I aspired to be a professional athlete. I did not make it. But one of the iconic things I always wanted to do, and those of you who grew up in the 70s and the 80s might remember this, is that when the camera would pan over to, uh, to one of the players, they would do this. And although uh, I've never made it to live television, now through the, the techno technological advances we have, we now have live television. So it's my opportunity. Hey, Mom! <laughs> All right. So tonight's lesson is uh, God's gifts. So one of the greatest gifts the Lord has given us is the power to choose. I often marvel how the creator of the known universe and all that is entailed within it has given us free will. It's one of the cornerstones of our faith. In fact, every day we are faced with hundreds of decisions. We decide whether we will get out of bed or not, uh, what we'll eat, what we'll do, what we'll think, uh, what we will say. We make decisions about everything from how we style our hair to how we react to more serious situations at work or at home. And while it may seem like many of our daily choices are not the, that significant, it's important to understand that they do matter. God's gift of choice is given to each of us out of his love for us, even though the results of our choices sometimes are disastrous to us and displeasing to God. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, God says, I have set before you life and death, the blessings and the curses. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. It's important to understand that every choice you make is a seed you sow, and these seeds produce fruit in your life, either for life or death. So if we want to have the life Jesus died to give us, an abundant life full of peace and joy, then we need to make wise choices. C.S. Lewis wrote, every time we make a choice, you are turning the central part of you the part that chooses into something a little different than it was before. And taking your life as a whole with all your innumerable choices, all your life long, you are slowly turning this central thing into a heavenly creature or a hellish creature, either into a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself, or else into one that is in a state of war and hatred with God, 
with fellow creatures and with itself. I think many times we can be good at focusing on life's big decisions only to be defeated by the small ones. The Song of Solomon in verse two and excuse me, in chapter two and verse 15 actually tells us it's the little foxes that will spoil the vine. Likewise, the many small decisions we make every day add up and greatly impact our life. Very often it's not apparent to us that the poor choice doesn't always have, as the poor choice doesn't always have an immediate poor consequence. But we are warned against this type of thinking. In Galatians 6, verses 7 and 8, Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Now, if you're wondering, how can I know if I'm making these right decisions? Uh, then we're on, the right, we're on the same page, and I'm glad you asked. The great thing about God is that he did not leave us without counsel for the decisions we need to make. James 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generous, generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. He's also left us the word, and he has left us his spirit. So tonight I would humbly ask you to contemplate the decision that Joshua put to the people of Israel. In Joshua 24, 15, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the God of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, I will serve the Lord. If you have not put on Christ, there's no more convenient time than to do so now. Or if you are a Christian who needs the prayers of the church, again, there's no more convenient time. So will you please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Heart the gentle voice of Jesus calling tenderly upon your ear. Sweet is cry of love and pity calleth, turn and listen, stay and hear. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Then his loving tender voice so And is on you laying light and easy for his sake. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden. Come and I will give you rest. Let us all pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to first thank you for this opportunity to join together with your family and to, for many of us to think about you, to rewind from a busy week and help us focus again on you, Father. We're so thankful for this opportunity to be here. And Father, um, thank you for the devotion this evening about choices, and we pray every day that we make the correct choices that you would be proud of. Father, every day we have to make the decisions and they're not always probably beneficial 
to our lives as Christians, but we pray that you always give us the strength and the motivation to let us always strive to do your will in whatever we do. Father, we ask that you be with the speaker this evening in our lessons. And Father, we're again thanks, thankful so much for the leadership here, thankful for each member of our congregation, and thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus, and it's through his name we pray, amen. amen. Yes, please. All right, I have not heard the bell, but uh, it is 20 after, so uh, time to get this ball rolling. There's a handout coming around. If you don't have one yet, raise your hand, and uh, we'll get a copy to you. As you can see on the overhead there, this is uh, called the Law and the Gospel. So in general, what we're going to do is we're going to compare and contrast the Law and the Gospel. Um, Ten different points we're going to look at. By whom were they given? To whom were they given? Uh, there was two women that were allegories or um, symbols representing them. Who were they? Why was the law given? Why was the gospel given? Why? Um, what is the law called? What is the gospel called? What was Christ to the law? What is Christ to the gospel? And then finally, what use is the law now that it has been taken away and established? Uh, to establish the gospel. So, we've got a lot of scriptures to cover, and um, so we'll get right into this. So, the law and the gospel, by whom were they given? So, let's look first at the law, uh, Nehemiah 10.29, and I'm going to read most of these shorter ones, um, just because of, well, we'll see how time goes, but there's a lot of scripture we have to cover, and I'll probably ask someone to read the longer ones, just to give my voice a break. 
But Nehemiah 10.29 says, These joined with their brethren and their nobles and entered into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God. And that's the main thing we're looking at. It was given by Moses, um, the law of God. Now, of course, because it was given by Moses, that's why it's also called the law of Moses in some places. In John 7, verse 19, Jesus says, Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? So Jesus is saying the same thing, that the law came through Moses. All right, the gospel, on the other hand, John 1, 17, For the law was given through Moses just like we were talking about, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So grace and truth, let's, these two passages here, Galatians 1.6 and Galatians 2.5, Paul says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So the grace of Christ is found in the gospel. And then similarly in Galatians 2.5, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So the truth is found in the gospel as well. So the grace and truth are found in the gospel, and of course, um, this, and that's the gospel of Christ we're talking about. And then in Galatians 1, 11 to 12, if somebody would read that, please. Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, thank you. So, Paul, this came to him not from men. Um, It came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So here again, the gospel came through Christ. The law of Moses came through through Moses, or by the hand of Moses. Uh, but the gospel came through Jesus Christ. All right, to whom were they given? Leviticus uh, 26, verse 46, These are the statutes and judgments and laws which the Lord made between himself and the children of Israel on Mount Sinai by the hand of Moses. So again, it's by Moses. Um, But it was between the Lord and the children of Israel. And keep in Remember, to this point here that it was done on Mount Sinai, because that will become important in a little bit. And then Acts 25, 8 essentially says the same thing, slightly different words. Paul answering to Festus, he says, While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar, have I offended in anything at all. Here it's talking about the law of the Jews. But, of course, the children of Israel and the Jews are the same thing, just like you can call them Hebrews. Um, Jewish, um, it's all saying the same thing. So that's what the law was specifically for, that group of people. The gospel, on the other hand, Revelation 14, verse 6, says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. In other words, the gospel was for everyone. And Mark 16, 15, which we talk, we mention a lot in the, um, in the church. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature or to all creation or the whole creation. And, of course, when it says creatures, it doesn't mean bugs and ants and dogs and cats. It means people, every human creature on the earth. So it wasn't just the Jews. Now it was Jews and Gentiles. It was everybody. All right, let's go down to C. Which two women were an allegory or symbol of the law and the gospel? And if somebody would read this, uh, Genesis 21, verses 8 to 12, please. Genesis 21, verses 8 to 12. Genesis And the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, 
cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman and all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Okay, thank you. So we see here, of course, Sarah's considered the free woman, and her Egyptian handmaid, also called here a bondwoman, um, was given to Abraham. And through the bondwoman, through Hagar, uh, Ishmael was born. And then, uh, like 13 years later, Isaac was born through Sarah by a promise from God. And at the point where, she, where he was weaned, they had a, basically a feast. And uh, Ishmael was basically mocking or scoffing uh, at, the, at Isaac. And, of course, that didn't make Sarah too happy and basically said, cast her out. Cast her and the son out. All right, so important things to remember. Now we go to Galatians 4, 21 to 25. Here we get Paul saying, tell me. You who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Which things are symbolic or allegoric? For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. There's that Mount Sinai again. Remember, that's the law of Moses. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, which corresp- and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. All right, so which two women were allegoric or symbols of them? Hagar was the one that represented the law. And Nehemiah 9.13 just reemphasizes the fact that this was given by God to the Israelites on Mount Sinai. All right, but then Sarah, we have read in Galatians Four verses 28 to 31. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Christians are children of promise, just like Isaac was. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. And then, of course, Romans 9.9 9 emphasizes, For this is the word of the promise, at this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. So we are children, those who are of the gospel are children of Sarah, who was the free woman, uh, and were born of a promise. All right, so anyways, the law uh, is symbolized or allegorically given by Hagar, and the gospel is given by Sarah. All right, now, why was the law given? Galatians 3, verse 19, <clears throat> what purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. And, of course, that mediator was Moses. And in Romans 5, 13, it adds a little more information. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed, when there is no law. All right, so the law came in so that people essentially could be held accountable for their transgressions, for their sins. But until the law was in place, you would not be held accountable, even though there was sin going on because they were doing things that God didn't want done, living in a life that was not the way God wanted us to live or them to live at that time. So the law came because of transgressions and to make us accountable for our sins. But um, the other thing is Galatians 3.24, and maybe somebody read that, please. Galatians 3.24, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. All right, thank you. It was our tutor or schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So the law was put into place to ultimately bring us to the gospel, to bring us to Christ. 
uh, so we could be justified not by the law, but justified by faith in Jesus Christ and the gospel. Okay, so that's why the law was given. Now, why was the gospel given? Let's read Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So the gospel, its purpose, was for our salvation. Ephesians 1.13 says essentially the same thing. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It's the gospel of our salvation. That was a main reason it was given, so we could be saved, so we could be right with God and spend eternity with him. But also in Romans 1.16, and then it's actually verse 17 that contains the next piece of information. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we find the righteousness of God revealed in the gospel as well. And, of course, why was the righteousness of God important for us to know? Why, why is the righteousness of God important for us to know? Why do we need to know the, what is righteous in God's eyes? What's that? In order to be pleasing to Him. If we're not doing what's pleasing to Him, essentially we're going to be transgressing. We're going to be doing something that displeases him. So to be saved, we need to know what righteousness is so we can do it, which includes what he tells us to do to obey the gospel. And then we can be right in his eyes and be saved. Not that we're going to ever be perfect, because we won't. But that doesn't mean we don't strive to always please him. All right, so that's why the gospel was given. Now, what is the law called? Several things. Hebrews 8, verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no, no place would have been sought for a second. So there's a first covenant and a second covenant. And in Hebrews 9, 15. And for this reason, he is a mediator of the new covenant, and we'll talk about the new one in a moment, by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. Now, in the King James, instead of saying covenant, it says testament. So covenant and testament, they're both, the Greek word means a contract. And the old law, um, the law of Moses, here was called the first covenant or the first testament. And in a moment, we're going to see it was also called some other things like the Old Testament, which is what we normally refer to it as, when we pick up the Bible, we got the Old Testament and the New Testament. But it can also be called Old Covenant and New Covenant. All right, in Hebrews 8, 13, in that he says a new covenant, he made the first obsolete or old. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So it's also called an old covenant or decaying or um, obsolete covenant or becoming obsolete covenant. So it's a first covenant, but it's also an obsolete covenant, or becoming obsolete. And we're going to see in a little bit later, it is obsolete now. Um, and then number three, 2 Corinthians 3.14, if somebody would read that, please. But their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. All right, thank you. The veil is, remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Now, if you got the ASV, ESV, New American Standard, several others, they use the word New Covenant. I mean, Old Covenant. Um, whereas the New King James and King James say Old Testament. Again, it's that same Greek word. It just could be translated either as Covenant or Testament. All right, so for the Jewish people, when they read the Old Covenant, they still have this veil because the veil is not taken away until you basically commit yourself to Christ because the New Testament revealed what was hidden in the Old Testament. 
All right, number four, 2 Corinthians 3, 6, says, Who also, Jesus also made us, or God made us, sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, or New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. See, the Old Testament, we're going to read another verse in Romans 7, 6, the old letter kills, or it's the letter that kills. Romans 7, verse 6, but now we have been deliv delivered from the law, having died to that which we were held by, <clears throat> so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. So, the Old Testament can also be referred to as the old letter, the old written code, and in either case, it's the letter that kills. It didn't bring life, it brought death, because nobody could live perfectly under it. You just couldn't do it, except for Jesus. All right, and finally, Hebrews 10.1, if somebody would read that, please. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things can never, uh, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. All right, thank you. So the, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things. So the old law, um, or the law, also called the old covenant, first covenant, obsolete covenant, <clears throat> the letter that kills, was also a shadow of the good things to come. It foreshadowed, of course, Jesus Christ coming and making everything available to those who obey him. All right, so it was just a shadow. All right, now the flip side of that, we look and we basically compare that now with what the gospel is called. So the old law was called the, the first covenant or first testament, whereas the gospel is called the second covenant. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. All right, so we got a first covenant, the Old Testament, and then the second covenant, the gospel. Hebrews 10.9 says the same thing. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first covenant, or the first will, that he may establish the second covenant, the second will that God had given. All right, so first covenant, second covenant. Obsolete covenant, now we're going to see there's a better covenant. Hebrews 7.22. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. All right, it's better because it's not becoming obsolete. It's not becoming old and decaying. It's, it's a living covenant. And, oh, in Hebrews 7, 22, the King James says uh, a better testament. And then Hebrews 8, 6, saying essentially the same thing. But now he has obtained a more, Jesus has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. All right, first covenant, obsolete covenant, now the second covenant, the gospel, which is a better covenant or better testament. And then what we're most familiar with, it's also called the New Testament or New Covenant. Hebrews 8.8, 8, because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So he's going to make a new covenant, a new testament. And in Hebrews 9.15, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the New Covenant, or New Testament, as the King James says, by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the First Testament, or First Covenant, which is the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. So, First Covenant, obsolete, old. Second Covenant, the Gospel, better covenant. It's a New Testament. And that's why when we look in our Bibles, we think of we have an Old Testament, and we have a New Testament, an Old Covenant and a New Covenant, the Gospel and the Law of Moses. All right, as we mentioned, number F4, the, old, the, the law was considered the old letter or written code that kills. The Gospel is the spirit that gives life. Second uh, Corinthians 3.6, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the New Covenant or New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 
and Romans 8, 2 is similar. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. The gospel set me free from the law of Moses. All right? So, the, New Test the gospel, the New Testament, is what gives us life. By obeying it, doing what it says, it gives us eternal, eternal life, that is. It won't bring back our dead bodies by making us heal from some kind of sickness, but spiritually, it can make us, give us eternal life. All right. The, old the law, the Old Testament, was also a shadow of good things to come, whereas now, which we read something we read earlier, number 5, Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The other one was a shadow of things to come. The New Testament, the gospel, is the power of God to salvation. Um, it has great power, and it's not just a shadow. It's the living thing, the thing which actually brings us, um, being, it reconciles us to God, puts us in the church, and makes us right uh, for eternal life. One last thing, and I'm sure we could find others if we looked, Ephesians 1.13 in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the gospel of your salvation is also called the word of truth, which makes sense. That's what we read earlier. It's that grace and truth came through Jesus, and the gospel is considered where the, is where we find the grace of Christ. It's also where we find the truth. All right. So what was Christ to the law? Somebody read, please, uh, Matthew 5, 17 to 18. Batteries die. All right, uh, Matthew 5, 17 through 18. Yes. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is all accomplished. All right, thank you. Um, King, King James, New King James says, Do not think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And we're going to see in just a moment... That's exactly what Christ did. He came and he fulfilled the law. And we see that in John 19, verse 30. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. When he died on the cross, that was the final thing that needed to happen. And he was waiting for the fulfillment of one last scripture. They gave him some sour wine and he says, It is finished. And then that was the end. He had fulfilled all the requirements of the Old Testament law. All right, Romans 10, verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So he not only fulfilled it, <clears throat> he ended the law, or the need for the law. And then if somebody read Colossians 2, 14, please. Having wiped out the handwriting, the requirements that was against us, which has, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way and having nailed it to the cross. All right, thank you. The, hand white, the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Of course, that's referring to the Old Testament law. <clears throat> it was given by the hand of God, at least the Ten Commandments were, written on stone by God's hand or by his finger, <clears throat> but they were against us because we couldn't live up to all the requirements, or at least the Jews couldn't, and we couldn't either. And he has taken it out of the way. And so that's number three. He's taken the law out of the way, and he did this by nailing it to the cross, which is H uh, number four. Jesus nailed it to the cross. So he took it out of the way or set it aside and then nailed it to the cross. And Hebrews 10.9 essentially says the same thing. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, 
the old covenant, that he may establish the second, the new covenant, the new testament. So he's taken it, the taken away the first, that he may establish the second. All right, and then finally, Ephesians two fourteen or fifteen. If somebody would read that, please. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace. All right, thank you. He's abolishing his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create himself one new man from the two. He's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. By abolishing the law, he now can bring these two together, the Jews and the Gentiles, and that's happened in the church. All right, so what was Christ of the law? He fulfilled it. He ended it. He took it away or set it aside. He nailed it to the cross, and he abolished it. And that's because he fulfilled it. He could do all that. But now what is Christ to the gospel? Well, first off, he's its revealer. We read this earlier. Galatians 1, 11 to 12, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. It was revealed to Paul by Jesus Christ. So Christ is the revealer of the gospel. Hebrews 8, 6, But now he, Jesus, has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant which is established on better promises. So Christ is the mediator of the better covenant, which is, of course, the gospel, the new, the new covenant, the New Testament. And Hebrews 12, 24 says the same thing. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, the New Testament, and the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than that of Abel. And then here in uh, Hebrews 10, 9, if somebody would read that, please. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. Thank you. And we, we read that earlier, but <clears throat> Jesus took away the first, the first covenant, the old covenant, the law of Moses, that he may establish the second covenant, the gospel, the, the New Testament. And of course, so that leads us into the last question, which is probably the most important one on this, this whole slide. So what is the use of the law now that it has been taken away or set aside to establish the gospel? All right. <clears throat> We're going to see it's actually it's important for several reasons. First off, if somebody read Romans 15, verse 4. Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. All right, thank you. Whatever things were written before, that's talking about the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Um, they were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, may have hope. So it's written for our learning that we might have three things, patience or perseverance, comfort or encouragement, and hope. And, of course, a good example, at least I think a good example of that, is reading the book of Job and all the sufferings that he went through. But in the end, because of his patience, he was comforted and ultimately lived for another 140, 140 years. I don't know how old the man was, but um, he obviously must have lived back in the time of the patriarchs, maybe closer to Abraham. Um, or maybe even earlier than that, because if he lived another 140 years, not knowing how old he was at the beginning, um, you know, in the, up till the flood, they used to live to be up like 900 years old. But then after that, it started tapering down. 
Um, and Abraham lived to be like 175. So he might have been around that time frame. But anyways, from looking in the Old Testament, we can get that. We can get patience, comfort, and hope, or encouragement and perseverance. All right. Now this next reading is a little long, so if maybe uh, verses 1 through 11, maybe I get someone to read verses 1 through 6, and then someone to read 7 through 11. First Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 6. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. All right, thank you. <clears throat> um, let's, stay, let's talk about this for a little bit. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, the, talking to the Corinthians, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud. So this is going back to the time of Egypt, uh, when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt. And, of course, there was a cloud uh, by day, and there was a fire by night, which would lead them. Um, or sometimes it would just stay in one spot, and they would stay in that one spot. So they were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. So this is when the Egyptians were coming after them. God told Moses to spread up, uh, to basically part the sea. And then they eventually walked through on dry ground. And as they're walking through on this, they got water on one side and water on the other, and they got the cloud over the top of them. So figuratively, they're engulfed in water. And that's why it says there in verse 2, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Baptism is an immersion. It's not a sprinkling. It's not a pouring. It's being surrounded, covered, immersed in water. And that's figuratively what, they were, what had happened to them. And they all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Uh, that same Greek word is used in Matthew, the end of the, um, the Sermon on the Mount, and basically talking about uh, you know, the wise man who built his house upon the rock. Um, and the rains came, and the floods came, and it basically stood firm. We need to build our lives on the rock which, of course, is Jesus and his teachings. The teachings that he gave us, we build our lives on that, and we're building on a rock. All right, so this is all, of course, Paul is taking this information from the Old Testament, giving us examples. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, verse 5, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our examples, to the tent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lust, lusted. So they were written for our examples. Now, somebody for Finish reading 7 through 11, please. Neither be ye idolaters, as, some, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. All right, thank you. <clears throat> so he gives a lot of actually negative examples. When we were talking earlier about Job, uh, is that something we can take positive from? Things by being perseverant, being patient. God will eventually bless us. Um, we need to continue to have a strong faith so that we can continue to do what God wants us to do. But there's things that happen in the Old Testament we need to avoid. Things that he's talking about here, fornication, sexual immorality, um, just eating and drinking, basically doing a wild party, if you will. Avoid those things. All right, so the law is still gives us examples, both good and bad, that we can learn from. And that verse 11, the last thing that uh, was read by Devin, 
Now, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, that is, for our warning. Um, so the, the law gives us examples. It also gives us warnings, admonitions, uh, that we need to pay heed to. All right, now 2 Timothy 3.15 is important. And he says, from that, talking, Paul talking to Timothy says, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus. If you want to know how to be saved, don't go to your neighbor. Go to the Scriptures. The Scriptures will tell you how, what you need to do to be saved. Now, if your neighbor's teaching you from the Scriptures, great. But that's what we need to go to, to be wise for salvation, not deluded by something that's not true. All right. Then this last thing, let's just, if somebody read 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, please. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All right, thank you. I want to talk, before we go into the, what it makes this useful, I want to focus on that part in verse 16. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I get a little asterisk, and at the bottom there it says, uh, note, when Paul said all Scripture, he was including both Old Testament and New Testament Scriptures that were then in existence. And we can prove that because he wrote that in 2 Timothy. And, of course, he wrote 1 Timothy before he wrote 2 Timothy. And in 1 Timothy he said, For the Scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Well, those come from two different books of the Bible. The first one comes from Deuteronomy 25.4, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. So, there's the scripture. The other one, though, is a direct quote in the Greek from Luke 10, verse 7. And remain in, this, remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give you for the, this part right here, the laborer is worthy of his wages. Paul directly quoted from that, the laborer is worthy of his wages. Um, it, the New King James actually has it verbatim in both. Um, but if you look in the Greek, what it says in 1 Timothy 5, 18, and what it says there in Luke 10, 7 are identical. So Paul had in mind when he said all Scripture, not just Old Testament, but he had Old Testament and New Testament uh, Scriptures that were in existence at the time. All right, and because it is from God, it's God's Word that's inspired, it's God breathed, that came from God, therefore it makes it profitable for doctrine, which means training, or I mean teaching, sorry, for reproof, reproof here does not mean rebuke. Some translations actually have the word rebuke, but the Greek word underlying that means to prove again. The word reproof is kind of like the word retype, reprint. It means to do it again, um, to prove it again. In other words, the scriptures are the standard, and when we have a question, we go back to the standard to prove if this is right or wrong, if, if this is correct or incorrect. If this is from heaven or if it's from men. All right, and then once we do that, we can correct ourselves. So that's use, it's profitable for correction. And then finally, it's for instruction or training in righteousness because then we can know what's right in the eyes of God and we can train ourselves or instruct ourselves to do that. And with all that, it's how we can become complete or perfect, thoroughly equipped or thoroughly furnished for every good work. So those are the things, and of course those last two points include Old Testament and New, but those are the things that the law is useful for. Even though it's now obsolete, been taken out of the way, nailed to the cross, it's still for our learning that we may have patience, comfort, and hope. It gives us examples of both good and bad. It, it gives us admonitions or warns us. It can make us wise for salvation. It is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. And it's how we can become complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I think we're out of time. So thank you for your attention. And uh, if you've got any questions, you can just come up and ask me.
Hey, thank you guys. Appreciate that. Sure. Oh, yeah. I think by coming in, you said, you know, the two that are free that you cast them in the field. You know, they were the two people that the two people that are giving them free tonight. That's true. That's true. That'd be right. There's a lot of Christians who think you still need to follow the Old Testament Ten Commandments. Yeah. That, that's a good point. So when we say obsolete, when I have conversations with people about whether we should follow the Ten, ten Commandments, or we should, um, me, I'll, I'll say as well, it's came with two new commandments that will basically end up covering the Ten Commandments, right? And it's either love or God or love or God. You know, that's part of the Ten Commandments. And love your neighbor and you won't commit adultery, you won't steal, you won't do all these things right, right. to your neighbor. So it's, it's hard for me to say, well, it's obsolete, but yet it, we, 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 we know that murder and sin hold in there. So um, how can I tell them, well, they're, they're obsolete, but we're still following you know? We're only following things in the Old Testament if you can find them in the New Testament. That's why... The, ops, the Old Testament is obsolete. There's only one of the Ten Commandments you cannot find in the New Testament, and that's to obey the Sabbath, to watch the Sabbath. So when, uh, when we say the, the Law of Moses, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the, the Ten Commandments, are we, are we saying that those are all, all unchangeable? You know, the Ten Commandments, I, I, know, I know there's a lot more than just Ten Commandments. The there's a lot more than that. Right. There's like 613 laws. I mean, yeah. So when um, later on in Colossians it said it was talking about the, the handwritten ordinances, and then it goes on later to say, "Do not taste, touch, and feel." So then I guess I was I was confused about what we say. Um, so it says Colossians two. So the, it says these are which are concerns with marriage thing according to the commandments and doctrines of men. So did the Old Testament include doctrines of men no, that weren't no. part of the law? Of I think what he's saying here, um, okay, this is Old Testament. Uh, let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbath. That was Old Testament. Old Testament. Um, and but, but was that Law What's, of Moses? Was that, that was Law of Moses. It wasn't covered in the Ten Commandments, but... Um, it was the Law of Moses. Yeah, okay. You can find all that in the Law of Moses. Um, let no one cheat you in, uh, of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels. That's not in the Old Testament. Now we're, we're shifting from Old Testament things into stuff that people are claiming this is what you need to do and it's not found anywhere um, vainly puffed up and not holding fast to the head okay therefore if you die with Christ from the base prince of the world why is the living the world do you subject yourself to regulations do not see these are things that people are making up there are laws in addition to what's found in Christ do not handle do not taste do not touch um, that's what it's referring to it's not referring to Old Testament stuff so, so it seems I, I have to go back to this. I don't really know what's going Were there things that the Levites or the priests or other people that Aaron put in place that God didn't put in place? That Moses didn't say God did this, but, but we're going to do this. You know, the Catholics do that not, all over there. Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. You're right. The, the Catholics do. They, well, even making them of self a priest. That's Old Testament. You can't find it in the New. Other than the fact that we're all considered priests. <laughs> Thanks. I like it. That's the way I like it, too. I get a train to